I would like to welcome everyone. Um, hello, my name is Jalisa Johnston and I work as programs lead in the Learning and Community Partnerships Department at the Portland Art Museum. And I wanted to start off by sharing my audio description. Um, I am a black woman. I have um, black rim glasses, hoop earrings. Um, my hair is curly and it's black and it's up in a bun. Um, I'm wearing a black plaid shirt with a silver necklace. I'm in a blue room and I have two bookcases behind me. And with that, I'm very excited to be here sharing in tonight's program with you all. So um, we have a very full program tonight filled with a lot of rich questions and a lot of good and I'm sure hilarious discussion. Um, I would like to take this moment to remind Zoom audience members that if you have any questions for our speakers tonight, please enter them in the Q&A box. And if you are tuning in on Facebook, please enter your questions in the chat box and my colleagues will migrate them over to Zoom. While discussion is taking place, you may want to keep an eye on the chat box as my colleague Stephanie Parrish will be sharing links to our online resources for Art and Race Matters, the career of Robert Colescott including a link to a virtual walkthrough and an online exhibition, as well as past talks that we have had around the exhibition. Um, and if at any point during the program you feel called to help support future programs at the museum, we will also be sharing a donations link in the chat as well. And so now that all of our housekeeping is taken care of, it is, it is with much excitement that I introduce this program to you. Tonight's program, Perspectives on Colescott, Identity, Satire, and Politics, is the closing program to the exhibition, Art and Race Matters, The Career of Robert Colescott. Co-curated by Lowry Stokes Sims and Matthew Wesley, this exhibition was organized by the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati and is the first full retrospective of the career of Robert Colescott. To help bring context to this discussion and Cole Scott's work in life, I would like to share some words from Grace Cook Anderson, the Arlene and Harold Schnitzer Curator of Northwest Art here at the museum. In her introduction to the online exhibition of Art and Race Matters, Cook Anderson wrote the following. The career of the American painter Robert Cole Scott, um, born 1925 to 2009, um, has never been more relevant than at this present moment in time. Given the crisis of race relations, image management, and political manipulation in the current American landscape, his perspectives on race, life, social mores, historical heritage, and cultural hybridity forthrightly confront the state of global culture today. Cole Scott, who established his career in Portland with the support of gallery owner and philanthropist Arlene Schnitzer, initially made his mark on the art scene in the 1970s with paintings that transformed well-known masterpieces of art history by black facing the main characters. This provocative strategy challenged long-standing taboos about racial stereotyping while allowing Cole Scott to achieve his stated purpose to quote, interject blacks into art history, end quote. As he transformed familiar images to forge new unexplored social meanings and implications, Cole Scott became a pioneer in the reemergence of figuration in the 1970s and the strategies of appropriation in the 1980s. I would like to begin by highlighting that tonight's program is supported by Cheryl and Rena Tonkin and Marv Tonkin Leasing Company in memory of Alan Baron Tonkin. Perspectives on Colescott evolved from its original structure as an in-dialogue program, originally titled In-Dialogue, Satire and the Work of Robert Colescott. In-Dialogue is an occasional series of interdisciplinary discussion-based sessions that explore art on view at the museum in relation to works in the humanities, social sciences, and sciences. While still considering themes of satire and Colescott's work, Perspectives on Colescott is a wide ranging roundtable discussion that continues to embrace the spirit of community discussion and disagreement, where the notion of the expert is set aside to center the knowledge of creative voices and collective voices. As such, we will use tonight's time to embrace feelings of uncertainty and unravel our assumptions as we dive into challenging terrain. My hope is that you walk away from this program with more questions than answers. And it brings me a lot of joy to introduce our facilitators for this program, Broke Gravy. 
Rote Gravy uses improv comedy and storytelling to discover truth between the blurry lines of the daily grind. As three Black men living in America, they utilize their unique voices to spark thoughtful conversations on and off comedy stages. Through an open and honest dialogue, they exchange their experiences with those of their audience, exploring deeper perspectives on comedy, relationships, and humanity. Also, they're funny AF. And with that, I introduce Broke Gravy. Hey, how y'all doing? Uh, my name is Leon Anderson. Uh, I'm a black male uh, with a goatee slash beard, whatever you want to uh, call it as, facial hair. Uh, I'm wearing a navy blue Everett Aqua Sox hat uh, with the sticker still on the bill. Uh, I've got a black sweatshirt and I'm sitting in front of two whiteboards and a dartboard. I'll hand it off to Eric. Uh, my name is Eric Simons. Uh, I am a black male. I have black rimmed glasses, a uh, I guess we'll call it a beard. It's kind of like a 10 o'clock shadow. I'm wearing a blue shirt uh, with some red and orange kind of circly things on it. And I am in a uh, very white room. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris Williams. I am a black male. I have a bit of a beard. Uh, my head is freshly shaven. Ooh. I'm in a blue room and I'm wearing a red, uh, sensible red t-shirt and i'm wearing headphones on top of my head on Mom's. those headphones can you move yeah, the move microphone up. up in front of your mouth just so everyone can hear you <laughs> anyways thank you for joining us tonight and we've also brought two guests with us uh our first guest was recently named wine enthusiast top 40 under 40 tastemakers of 2020 She's a native of the Pacific Northwest and is the owner and founder of Dirty Radish Travel Company. Dirty Radish connects travelers to uh, <laughs> Dirty Radish connects travelers uh, to two of her favorite places, Oregon and France, for world-class hospitality and wine education. She is a certified sommelier and has a passion for wine in the Willamette Valley, so much so that she's making her first wines this year. That's Dirty Radish Wines. We'd like to thank uh, Siobhan Ball for joining us tonight. Siobhan. Thank you, Chris, so much. Uh, my audio description is I'm a black woman. I'm wearing a black turtleneck sweater, very beatnik for the occasion. I have a gold necklace on, gold earrings, short dark hair, and I'm sitting in front of honeycomb mirrors and my plant babies. <laughs> Thank you, Siobhan. Uh, our second guest for the night is originally from Philadelphia, but working on her jump shot here in Portland, Oregon. She is currently a creative director at Instrument and an adjunct professor of design at Portland State University. Her work is multidisciplinary, uh, ranging from illustration and brand design to interactive and experimental projects. She has shared her artwork globally through exhibitions, lectures, and workshops from New York to Japan. Her clients have included Nike and Google, and her illustrations have been published in the New York Times and ACLU magazine. She plans on ending this year finding the most festive jello mold in which to reconstitute her brain after all that we've been through this year. Uh, we'd like to welcome Nishat Akhtar and thank her for joining us tonight. Nishat. Hey, thanks, Chris. Um, my, I'm Nishat and my audio description is I am an Indian woman with long black hair and a ponytail to the side wearing a green sweatshirt with an orange embroidered tiger uh, that says kids of immigrants underneath it. I am sitting in a dark gray room in front of a fairly messy bookshelf, mostly full of books and a couple of other random objects, including a blazers noisemaker, a Ganesh and a framed photo of my mother. Awesome, thank you. Um, and we're really excited to have you here with us, Siobhan and Nishat and Broke Gravy to really dive into some discussion um, about some really complex work and thinking about that within the scope of today. So I want to start us off, um, or rather you all had um, requested that we start looking at this work. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, so this work is called The Bilingual Cop. 
and it was made in 1995, and I have an audio description for this. Centered in this painting is a police officer in a, tan, in a tan uniform, holding a gun and a baton, emerging from a red brick structure. His mouth is agape and his eyes stare in opposite directions from each other. The officer's head is framed by two white speech bubbles, uh, which contain slurs and profanity, one in English um, and one in Spanish. He towers over two men that sit slumped on the ground against the red brick wall. On the left is a black man in a yellow sweater and brown pants holding a bottle and a brown paper bag. His eyes are closed as he leans against a full garbage can. On the right is a brown man wearing a sombrero and off-white poncho and yellow pants. He holds a bottle as well as he slumps against a tall cactus. A yellow line on the ground separates the two of these men. And, you know, starting off with this work, I think it, you know, as we've already noted from like the introductions and thinking about Cole Scott, the work just continues to echo layers upon layers of different um, social, cultural, political issues um, that we're still grappling with. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you all just to start conversation is sort of how do you approach a painting like this? How do you approach this work specifically? And how does it resonate for you? Sort of where do you see it landing in today's, um, within the context of today? And how could we sort of pick it apart together as a group? Hmm. Um, I, for me personally, this is Leon talking. Uh, Immediately, just because I'm a black male, my gaze and my focus and attention um, is drawn towards the left side, uh, which has uh, the black gentleman kind of slumped against a trash can in the foreground. Um, but the thing that really stands out for me um, is that the background of this, uh, there are pyramids and sunshine, then the middle ground, there's sort of this um, almost Caribbean Esque, like uh, palm trees, thatched roof uh, structure. And then you have the uh, poverty in the foreground. Um, and it's what you see in the foreground, that is the message that we constantly hear in the media. Um, and it is absolutely true. But unfortunately for black and brown folks, we only hear that side of the message. And we don't ever hear about the greatness uh, that we come from. And we don't hear about the great things that we're doing today. And so it's, uh, it's interesting that the highlight of this painting is the same highlight that I see on the news every day. And it's where the focus is every day. And it reinforces that negative stereotype. And it reinforces that within us as children of black and brown people. Wow, I love that. Can I, can I add, this is Nishat speaking, and I just want to add something to that. I hadn't even noticed um, the sort of progression of landscapes from the background to the foreground because, um, and so I'm, I'm really grateful to, you know, experience this painting through your eyes and notice what you've noticed. Um, for me, when I first saw this, I, um, noticed the police officer in this sort of like distorted manner in which he is illustrated and thought similarly to what you're talking about with the news, how we often think that authority equals accuracy and that is not at all the case when it comes to, of course, police forces and even our government and how it's so important to be able to do exactly as you did, Leon, take us through the deeper context of uh, the history and what we can see here, or even just, I think in uh, Cole Scott's paintings, you can peel back so many different layers, but authority does not necessarily equal accur accuracy. And I think that this painting to me really begins to uh, sort of beget that when we look at it. Um, this is Chris. I think what's happening for me is I'm, I'm very focused on the, the police person, not because they look like a monster, because they kind of do in this, but because the two men um, who are underneath him, not only are they not threatening, they actually look like they're passed out or asleep, yet his club is out and his gun is out. So that kind of resonates strongly with me, especially in these days. Um, they're literally not a threat at all. I'm not even sure they're aware of his presence. And yet that club is out, 
looking like it's ready to strike and that gun is out and we all know what a gun is for it's mm -hmm. to shoot bullets out of so that's what kind of stands out to me absolutely and um Nishad again i just want to add i think julissa mentioned that this painting was made in 1995 and you know, we're talking about the relevance today. And, and there's something again about that distorted figure that really reminds me of Emery Douglas's work, who is the Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party, who was making work um, and commentary on the police and the relationship of Black Americans in the 60s. And there's such, there's such a similarity of, um, again, the authoritarian figure uh, being sort of powerful. And yet the Black and Brown folks are actually just, like you said, exact. Uh, innocent in their movement they're asleep why would what is why would you attack somebody who's not moving or doing anything i mean i know i know why a police officer would do that but yeah this is siobhan the first thing that i we talked you guys were talking and it's like this was 20 over 20 years ago this was painted and it's so relevant today not just relevant but so relevant today and for me, the same thing, seeing the background with the pyramids and the mountains and the sort of sunset, but also what's beyond that. I'm curious, like what's beyond those pyramids? What's beyond those hills? What does it look like? Because I feel like there's always this idea that these other places aren't civilized mm -hmm. when there's thriving cities, people doing thriving things and living thriving lives, but we always just see the hut or this like adobe sort of home here, which you would think is less than because it's made out of mud, but that's where we were all living at some point. <laughs> it's in mud huts and things like that. But then as you come forward, of course, there's all these other things happening with the two slumped and the yes, very much prominent gun out. What I also love about this painting is the way that animals seem to be facing and sort of confused in their look as to what's going on. And they're just chill. <laughs> In the front but they're also like curious as to like what's happening why is this oh. person out but i also like too the the police officer's eyes are very distorted and crossed like he's so busy worrying about all these other things he's so discombobulated with having to deal with these two different sides for no no reason really right but he's so concerned that he can't even see straight that's what i hone in on so uh this is eric speaking there's a so the thing that really struck me about that kind of in addition to the contortion and just kind of the the way that his image is kind of molded to fit whatever he needs is that um is the the way that the two narratives that he is speaking are exactly the same which makes it feel like there's just kind of a, a structure. There's a way that, that you, there's a certain way that you exert your power and you really can follow a script. And you can follow the script so tightly and we've got your back so well that you can have your gun out, you can have your club out. And something that I never noticed until like looking at this picture right now, but in terms of where he, he thinks his power lies, he has an erection. I never knew that there was an erection Dang. holding up his belt. Yo. And it's like that, wow. just at even at this level, he needs this level of power, this level of authority over, as Leon, or excuse me, as Chris pointed out, um, people that aren't even threatening, that aren't paying attention to him, aren't even necessarily awake. Um, but he's sitting behind his, he's sitting behind a wall yelling over it exerting power that he thinks he has mm. and it's when... also so sick that he's like aroused by this violence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's not a very large erection by the way that's, <laughs> that's why you had to lean in but the the arousal of the violence or even of the process of this system that you're talking about about that reading the script is so um, like exciting to this individual is like actually adds to the like, I don't know, uh, demonic disgust of the of of his character. It, mm -hmm. it makes me think about with all the protests that have been going on the last year for, or, you know, obviously they've been going on longer than that, but they've been an uptick in the last year or so. And how after every single 
incidents, they say the exact same things, whether it's uh, the police chief, whether it's uh, Portland's shitty mayor, whether it's uh, you know, whatever it's any cop that they pull along and say this is what happened, or whether it's the people who are watching the news and contorting their view to justify why cops would put property and money over people's lives and livelihoods. It's just kind of the same script, the same thing over and over with no deviation because enough of the game has been rigged in their advantage that they don't have to work that hard. They can mm -hmm. read the same script. Also, if you read the same thing over and over and over again for like a hundred years or so, your eyes also might start to spin, yeah. ar spin around in their sockets as they are in for this character. And also like, he has this police officer in the middle. Um, he literally has no background. Like, there's this deep, rich history on either side, which are being that. demonized and like, put down, lambasted. Meanwhile, he's here in his citadel and like, has, has nothing back there, has no history. So really, this moment right now is his crowning glory. Like Putting these two people down and exerting his power is all that he has. Well, what is he protecting, right? Because like they say here to serve and protect but like leon just said this is chris by the way there's nothing there and there's so much richness on both sides um all he has is this somewhat broken down brick wall which is offering him a little bit of protection but again it's protection against what so what i see is someone with no history as leon put it getting ready to take mm -hmm. right and he's just right in that dividing line with his little erection just getting ready to take yeah and um, in, in and the, the quote and what he's saying he just goes straight in it's just oh. hey and then blah 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 it's all these things and i love that there's always of course you've got to say lazy mm -hmm. because obviously right mm -hmm. and um good for nothing Inhuman. I mean, inhuman. Yeah. Right. So that's where the justification comes in, in that behavior, right? It's not human. So that's where that gets to come in. And it's, you're right, like the whole thing about these aren't even people who are if any sort of threat. Just mm, makes me think about being a Black woman and just being asleep. I'm not, I'm a threat. Just right. Just yeah. Like if you want to be powerful. I must be powerful the, in my yeah. sleep. Those those walls that they hit with the bullets are worth more than the bullets that hit your body. Mm -hmm. That's what we learned with uh, Breonna Taylor. Breonna Taylor. Thing. And wow. he's not. He's not. He's kind of hyping himself out up. He's not talking to anybody. There's nobody mm -hmm. for him to talk to except for these um, two men who are who are either passed out or sleeping. So he has to come in with the racial slurs and the threats yeah. to kind of hype himself up to mm -hmm. convince himself of what he's about to do. Because he clearly is about to do something. Like mm -hmm. this, this painting, um, to me anyways, is fluid. It's action and process. He's about to inflict harm. But what's really interesting to me is both of those weapons are pointed at the Black man. Mm -hmm. are aimed in on the black man so it looks like he's gonna start there and do you see that line down the middle yeah mm -hmm. the yellow line I, it's like it's like there's these th those two sides are divided yeah well if you but, think about yeah like la everything yeah if you think about los angeles uh one of the most diverse and segregated cities and so you have these communities that for all intents and purposes, especially Blacks and Latinos, they, there's no reason why they should be at, e at odds with each other. But there is a force that has acted upon them that causes them to see themselves as two completely different people instead of being able to gather together against the force, against the police force, against the white aristocracy that's moving into all of their neighborhoods. Um, mm -hmm. This is the way that like colonialism works 
you split people up, you break them down into these small groups, have them fight against each other and do your dirty work for you. And yeah. so you come out lily white and clean at the end of it, even though you have nothing. Like if it was, yeah. uh, what do you have? You're not bringing anything to the table. Mm -hmm. um, this is Jalisa here speaking. And I was wondering actually um, that opens up like a really good avenue for thinking in terms of like the scripts that you guys were talking about, like following a script, like playing into a structure that is continually playing out even like right now it's happening. Um, and I wanted to use that as a way to like turn and look at another work and consider, um, hold on, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and switch to uh, this other work. So this here, I get a thrill too when I seize Deku. And I think one of the things like in the last painting where we, you guys were teasing apart the, um, I mean, racial dynamics, right? And that's something that is like, I think front and center stage in Cole Scott's work and in works like this, you know, where he really is playing with um, like stereotypes, certain set, set stereotypes and inserting them into art history quite a bit. Um, and before a discussion starts, I just wanna read um, the uh, audio description for this. So the title is, I Gets a Thrill To When I Sees Deku, 1978. This portrait painting centers an abstract figure of a woman Prominent brush strokes of pinks, yellows, white, purples, grays, and greens blend together. Her body is partially defined from these abstract color shapes through a black outline of her breasts and a roughly painted yellow leg wearing a brown high heel shoe, which emerges from pink brush strokes that suggest her skirt. Although this painting is primarily abstract and fluid, the face of the woman is clearly defined to resemble the mammy stereotype. She is a black woman wearing a red handkerchief tied around her head. She dons a wide smile as her wide eyes stare out towards the right side of the painting. In small black lettering at the bottom of the painting is the phrase, I get to thrill too when I see Deku. So I'm wondering if we can like extend that conversation to thinking about the role that stereotypes play in the work and in this one in particular. This one really hits me. <laughs> This particular piece really hits me because <clears throat> the stereotype of the mammy or the Aunt Jemima that this is portraying is such a difficult stereotype as a full figured black woman. I can't wear a head wrap in the world. Well, I couldn't, I do now, cause I don't care. But that's the immediate go to, right? If, if you're a full figured black woman, it's the immediate, you're the, it's a, like a mammy thing. And to take a piece from, um, from art history that is iconic and throw this very uh, other iconic, very racist uh, painting or picture on top of that is just, like you can't not have a feeling about this painting. So much so that this was the painting they put it on the side of the Portland Art Museum and took it down because it just struck so much in people. They were uncomfortable. And I'm curious, I you know, Portland being the a city that's majority white, were the people who were complaining white or black or both? Because I feel like Black people would have been uncomfortable or maybe mad, but if they had kind of known who this was or what this was about, perhaps, but I feel like it was more that people were uncomfortable with having to remember that this is very racist country that mm -hmm. we live in. There's, um, you know, I, I have a personal, uh, it's Nishad here, I have a personal, uh, like, unique scenario living in this country, not being Black or white, but being brown. And um, I think that 
I, I agree. This is a very confrontational painting to look at. And I actually think that when we think about threatening white women and threatening fem, uh, the sort of iconography of, uh, you know, white woman, which has come to mean so much in art history as an image of like pure beauty. And that is what has been defined to us through academia to threaten that th through uh, adding the stereotypical Mamie car caricature on top of it could have been what offended the Portland, the Portland people. I don't know. I think that there's yeah. a lot, there's a lot to be sh shaken about this image a lot. But one thing that I think that I've learned in the last few years is that white women are very vocal and opinionated about protecting themselves and not necessarily others. So when it comes to your question, Siobhan, of like who in Portland was looking at this and making making the phone calls and we know who's <laughs> right. quick the phone calls. <laughs> Please keep it honest. Please. You know what I'm saying? That's who's like calling. Who's calling? <laughs> <laughs> to protect the innocent Portland Art Museum can yes, express to, protect <laughs> to protect a building not to protect not to protect the folks that are seeing this and are, are being reminded of a heritage of racism we're being reminded of their erasure of being you know black women and their own identity and being reminded that not even having a choice to dress the way you want because of who who you are I, I think that that phone call is is not about that threat and more about a threat to this the sense of safety of the white feminist individuality. I don't know, just a guess. I um, think you're right because the the whole, not to get too deep into it, but it's like the whole purpose of that sort of mammy figure was to keep black women from being seen as sexual beings because mm. heaven to bit, I mean, if you go deep down, it's like the whole Rosa Parks thing. People think it was this old lady sitting on a bus. No, black women are being raped and and um, sexually assaulted on buses, and no one wanted to admit that because then that would be admitting that white men were attracted to black women, and that wasn't going to happen. And that's exactly where this caricature comes in: is to keep that that message down. I went to Noma in New Orleans and saw Micheline Thomas's work, which is kind of similar in this way. And to see black women in be like in that kind of beauty, I mean, what a difference that could make in the world if that was the, the normal, right? Or you saw more of that, or you saw more brown skinned people. But if you have this image, people aren't really thinking of them as a threat in that way. This keeps that threat down. It's like, it's crazy to think I'm a threat, but apparently. <laughs> Siobhan, may I ask a question? And then actually, th this is open to everyone, but um, you're just talking, I'm glad that you brought up Micheline Thomas because uh, Micheline Thomas, you know, does similar work in that um, she inserts Black women into art history in a way that does really amplify beauty. And um, then that makes me think about something like this where the stereotypes, you know, very hurtful imagery is inserted into the art canon in this way. And I'm wondering if like, do you think there's value here? Um, and if so, what is the value in having this kind of conversation where we're looking at this, you know, Mammy figure um, as a part of like the art uh, dialogue? Um, well, two things. One, I can't remember, I feel like I was listening to something and Cole Scott had talked about, you know, first there's like the humor of this, but then like you have to get past that eventually and sit with it. And then you get into the sort of sadness of what you're looking at. And you have to kind of go through those phases. It's like a, it's sort of just how you have to digest it all. Because you could look at this and be like, this is hilarious, right? Cause that's a joke to be a mammy, to be an Aunt Jemima. Like it's a, that's the first thing that some people may think of. And then like you have to sort of dig deeper and you have to go through the layers of what this painting is on top of. And I think that that's a good thing because we have to sort of digest this. What is this and why is it so, um, why does it give me such a visceral reaction? And the more I like 
delve into my own blackness, especially this year, and seeing works like this and Michaelin Thomas, I go back to uh, as a full figured, intelligent black woman living in America, I get a lot of uh, people saying they're intimidated by me. And intimidated means two things, to be in fear of or to be overawed. And I'm gonna go with people are overawed. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm not carrying a weapon. So I don't understand that. And I think that goes to this. It's like, you would be in awe of this if you're looking at the woman I painting, right? But then you take this and put this on top of it and you're not anymore. Now you're just hook on its head. So this, this is very important. This is a very important piece. I'm really impressed. Yeah, I think his, his work uh, irritates a lot of people is the impression that I'm getting. And I just keep going back to what Nishat said about how much discomfort were you experience, experiencing that you made the phone call, right? So that that a piece of art was threatening to your reality, basically, to who to your comfort, right? This is threatening my comfort. This is threatening my experience of having a pleasant and lovely day, which is that fragility. So I must do what I can to get rid of this instead of sitting with it, right? And thinking about, well, why is this bothering me? What does this mean? Let's go deeper. Um, especially in this country, we like to just get rid of it. Re get rid of it, right? Sit with it. I'm not going to sit with it. I want to get rid of it instantly. I'm not saying you can't get rid of things. Some things, absolutely. Okay. But sit with it. Why? Go, go to the why. Why is this bothering you? Why is this irritating you? Right? But no, just get rid of it. And I think what you said, Siobhan, is just, I, I don't think many people got there <laughs> who were making those phone calls, I should say, got to that level, right? It's just like, just, ooh, I don't like this. Mm -hmm. Being uncomfortable is that being like in that kind of discomfort is an inconvenience. It's an inconvenience to you. People will mm -hmm. not sit in that. That's why we're, a lot of the reasons that we're in the state that we're in when it comes to racial issues in this country is people don't want to sit with the discomfort of the fact that I'm 40 years old. I've lived in the Pacific Northwest my whole life. And if you want to think that someone's not going to say a word to me when I wear a head wrap, you're not paying attention. Mm -hmm. mm. You're really not paying any kind of attention. If you think I can walk out in these in the streets and have someone not say something to me by the because I'm wearing a head wrap, not necessarily call me Aunt Jemima or make some sort of thing, but it, it's a thing, right? But they feel like they can and have the license to say something to you, even if they don't know you, because they're trying to get on your side. They're saying, oh, look, I recognize you. I see you. I see you. But it's That's like, I'm like do, you, <laughs> do you see me? Like you see a uh, crack in the sidewalk? Like it's something that you need to call out and protect other people from or protect yourself, make yourself look better. Um, there was something in the chat there that actually, uh, hit on one of the elements that we were talking about earlier um, but it's talking about the mammy um, and how uh, during slavery uh, and even after slavery even still today people of color raise white children during mm -hmm. uh, to the point where they are breastfeeding mm -hmm. the white child uh, that mm -hmm. is not their own they're not allowed to have children because they need to be there to take care of those white children so this allows that white woman to get her figure back, to be sexy, to be desirable, to go off and do all of the things, all the luxuries in life, while the black woman has to just smile and grin and bear it and raise the child that will end up whipping her potential family, her children, her cousins, her, et cetera, et cetera. 
And it's like, that's one of the things that I see in this is that dichotomy. There's the sensuality in whiteness that is below the neck. And then you have this like comical fucking shit eating grin uh, that pops out on top. And it's like, it's like, no, blackness cannot be sexy is what this is telling me up front. Because there's so many layers to that. The handkerchief itself is a whole thing. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a it's a whole thing the handkerchief on the head as a head wrap as a as a black woman who wears them it's not for you it's yeah. for me it's to protect my hair yeah. <laughs> and also sometimes I'm really lazy and I don't feel like doing it so I want to just throw a head wrap on and go on about my day it's not this other thing this head wrap because of the history of it because uh it was becoming seen as, because you have to imagine these, you know, African people come over here as slaves. This is a new thing. There's no white women doing this. So it must be this lesser than thing. And then we have now the caricature of it. We've turned it into this whole thing. And so the fact that she has not only the the head wrap on, but that her teeth are so white. Mm. It it blows me. I love this painting so much. I got a, a question uh real quick sorry eric but i would find if i'm keeping it real with myself i would experience work like this differently depending on who i'm with so Mm -hmm. broke gravy we got the chance to see the exhibit live and it was packed there were a lot of people there uh and i would go up to some of his works and (laughs) depending on who was around me i would be either less or more kind of comfortable with it, meaning that if I'm the only black person looking at this piece surrounded by white people, I'm going to have a different experience of this piece all of Mm -hmm. a sudden. And that that irritates me. It goes back to that conversation Broke Gravy has sometimes, and I've actually had with Siobhan about watermelon, right? Like, why can't I, as a black person, enjoy a slice of watermelon regardless of who's around? Like, let's keep it real, right? Mm -hmm. Not peacefully. But I've been so I've been so indoctrinated into this bull crap, right? I said bull crap. I never say bull crap, but into this <laughs> in this bull hockey. <laughs> into this garbage that if I want a slice of watermelon, I gotta go through all of these layers. Oh my god, this is like, oh, is this a stereotype? What are they thinking? Right? It's just watermelon, right? So why can't I experience art the way I want to experience art? Why is my experience of it affected by who's around me? Like that's how deep it goes. If because, that makes sense. because this isn't normal. This is this the idea of a woman wearing a, of a woman. First, let's talk about a woman wearing a a head wrap or a, a handkerchief on her head isn't like a normal thing. And then when a black woman does it, it's like it's a black person thing and then it's like a it's a my it's a mammy thing it's just like it has those layers to it and that's it's it's unfortunately an understanding that isn't known amongst the masses you know because you have a ethnic hair section in the store that's this big (laughs) it's often behind the counter you gotta Uh, find it yeah locked up locked up Mm -hmm. locked um Mm -hmm. the the thing that really strikes me about this is that it feels like by placing a caricatured essentially a caricatured face over a loosely very shoddily defined body it's just another way of talking about how black women are disposable it doesn't matter which black face you got you just need a black face. You just need a mammy. It can be anyone. And it's all in, as it's been mentioned, in the name of preserving whiteness to preserve the white woman, whether it's because she had her standards and let, you know, they're not, they're better standards than black had, obviously much better. They weren't great. They're very low next to white men. Sure. But it was still about preserving that. And and that discomfort, whatever it is, is so prevalent that there's even, I'm, I'm looking in the Q&A and someone asked first, two questions in one sentence, basically, 
black women were sexually assaulted on buses, which seems like an initial disbelief. And then evidence, question mark, which is a, is like, is less of the, I don't believe it than the, I don't believe you. Mm -hmm. And literally in that time, it took me three seconds to do a Google search and find information on it. So Mm -hmm. do the fucking work. (laughs) Stop asking for us to justify our experience and you do the fucking work. Mm -hmm. It's not that hard. It but really isn't. I'm doing a panel and I looked up information on it. So what's the <laughs> no. excuse? That's the first of all. But second of all, I love how we I love how people think that somehow black people or people of color have their have taken we went to we went to uh elementary school we went to middle school went to high school and then in our spare time we went to our own culture school and learned Mm -hmm. about our own history we know the history just like everybody else i had to figure it out too as amanda seals beautifully said i know a ton about the holocaust i'm proud to know a ton about the holocaust but that's because that's what was taught in the school i don't know about the true rosa Parks story of women being sexually assaulted and raped on buses because that's not the story that was told in the yeah. book, in the in the books in school. The story was that it was an old lady. She wasn't old, but she wasn't tired of her feet weren't tired. Her mind was tired. So like I think that that also goes back to the thing I said earlier, which is authority does not equal accuracy. Just because something is handed to you does not mean that that is what is correct, especially within this American education system and government that has been built all upon white supremacy and the success of whiteness, the suppression of black and brown folks. And to make any assumptions within that is not, um, that's in itself is almost violence. But now I'm uncomfortable and you gotta stop. I'm uncomfortable. So I need to stop this somehow. So what can I do? What can I do? Um, evidence. Okay. I'm, uncomf- I'm uncomfortable. So I, I, I hate that I'm keep on being drawn to the chat, but it's uh, it's like <laughs> fucking colonizer 101. It's like yeah. nobody here equated rape with sex. Yeah, I don't know <laughs> when that came up. And so it's like you take a nugget of truth and then you amplify it to this point where it's like so outrageous that it no longer becomes a conversation. So like asking for data, nitpicking, amplification, these are all tools of supremacy. To bring it back around just to answer that question, the way that we got there was that the reason, partial reason of the story, the true story of women being raped on the bus not being told was because then that would mean that white men would have to admit to their white wives that they were sexually turned on enough to rape a woman of color on these buses as they were coming to and from their low income housing and working in the rich white ladies' houses. Look it up, but that's not the conversation. The point is, is that that's, this is exactly the thing of the, the painter who painted the original painting woman eye painted the woman's body in this way because he felt joy in the grotesque. And that painting was seen as iconic and amazing, this curvaceous, woman to be seen with this bosom but once you throw a mammy on top of it it's a whole different situation and to not see the parallel there is where we're at right now um if i may interject this is jaleesa speaking um i wanted us to um, with that same thread um potentially look at the eat them taters but I also want to be mindful of the time and it's 722 and I want to make sure that we get to works that you all um, really want to talk about. So um, do you have a preference for where you want to move next in the conversation? I really love Ethan Taylor's, but Let's I also go. love I Okay, all right. Yeah, they're still asking for evidence in the chat, <laughs> Siobhan. They, they, you're talking about incidents that happened to you, but they really want evidence from you. <laughs> um it's wild because of the that's not what i'm saying I, oh no 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 you don't yeah. you, you don't owe them anything yeah Shabani. i know and I know. Uh, later and it'll be fine they also asked for us to move on because it's not moving at their pace <laughs> <laughs> it got too deep it got too deep went all too right. far all right there's nothing sexual about this one let's get back to 
<laughs> Nothing sexual about taters? Eat. What taters you been eating? <laughs> Eat them taters. So before we start conversation on this one, um, I do want to read the um, audio description. So Eat Them Taters, 1975. Here we see a domestic setting centering five black people, presumably a family. They sit at a wooden table in a dark house that is lit from an overhead oil lamp. On the far left of the painting, we see a man sitting in profile wearing a dark blue shirt and brown pants. Sitting across from him are two women in brown dresses with white bonnets, along with a man with white hair, a hat, and a brown shirt. The woman on the far right pours four cups of brown liquid, probably coffee or tea, while the other women, while the other woman and the man in the blue shirt share a plate of potatoes. All four, all four adults are audience facing and smiling, aside from a young girl who stands almost central to the painting with her back to the audience. In the upper right corner is the title, Eat Them Taters, painted in large letters. So I was thinking that we could extend, sort of like rope the conversation back to thinking about the use of stereotypes and using art history and using art in general as a way to sort of pick apart these um, images that could potentially, I mean, did hold a lot of power, still do hold a lot of power in certain ways, in certain contexts, um, and thinking about how, how that shows up here in the work. I also really love this piece. <laughs> Just because I really love Van Gogh's uh, potato eaters. And I love that Robert makes this painting and puts Vincent down at yes. the bottom. Mm -hmm. right. It's I just, I love that. I love that <laughs> so much. But I love the, because I, I really do enjoy the Van Gogh version in the sense of the colors, just the, the darkness and the, the, the dirty sort of peasant sort of feeling. But this in some way seems more joyous, but that's the point too, is that that was the idea that black people could be happy with less. Well, it's because we had to be. Had to. Mm -hmm. Because we chose happy, we chose joy. We still do in this time. <laughs> it's also, I think that that is like for black and brown folks, that is our, like convening is our natural sense of joy with our people. Whereas whiteness is so much about individuality and um, that is a sense of success where for many of us, it is about our community. Mm. Um, I agree like in the, in the Van Gogh painting, it is not, uh, it's much more somber than this one. I think it sort of seems like um, a quiet conversation is happening and the tea is pouring, but here there's laughter, smiles, conversation that you can feel. Yeah. I will say like I had never seen, before seeing this one, I had never seen the Van Gogh potato eaters, which I think is also a powerful element of bringing black, interjecting blacks into the art world is that I would have never researched or looked at that Van Gogh painting ever if it wasn't for having seen this, drawn an interest to it, which then led me back to this other work of art. Um, but looking at them side by side, you're right in the shot, like the other uh, potato eaters is definitely somber, but there's that like beautiful glow that's there that says that there is a warmth in the house. Um, and this one is, fucking Saturday night or Saturday morning cartoons like with the big bold like eat them taters font like coming up next on the WB and it's so the joy is so over the top that it becomes satirical again so it's like there's that level of you look at it once you see one thing you look at it again you see the happiness you look at it again you see the satire you look at it again you see the white christianity on the picture on the side and like you, that's what i get the irritating that chris said about cole scott's work is mm -hmm. that i can't stop looking at it mm -hmm. it just like gets in my brain and it just keeps on working and I never find everything about it. I fucking love it. Mm. Yeah, I may add something. Oh, sorry. Oh, who was who is that that was about to talk? I wanna. The shot. 
Nishat, go for it. I was just going to say, I, th I think Siobhan was, was um, referencing this earlier, but um, I think there's a curator talk about this, about the exhibition. And uh, someone says when it, it, it's about the humor is the bait. And then once you sort of have that bait in your mouth and then you have to start, and then you start chewing on it and it's very, the curator didn't say this part, but it's like very gamey in the sense of there's so <laughs> much in your mouth to chew. Luscious. Yes, and there's so, there's so much and you're like, you taste the first thing and you're like, oh, this is funny. And I'm invited into this like cartoon sort of, you typically in most of the work, it's like a very pop color, bright pinks and all of this, but you're invited in with the smiling characters and you're like, hmm, okay, this is inviting. This is about community. And then you keep chewing and you start getting the, the aftertaste, the racist aftertaste that comes <laughs> inevitably. Would you ever describe a wine as that, Siobhan? <laughs> Notice the subtle I mean, notes of racism. <laughs> I mean, I I think for on my coke is that. <laughs> I think for me this uh, this I still don't know if I like Cole Scott's work, like his style. It really I I I don't know that, um, and it does irritates me. There's a real minstrel feel to this, right? Yeah. And it. That bothers me, but what I'm not willing to do, um, and I, I'm not looking at the chat for this reason, y'all. What I'm not willing to do is to let that instantly stop me from continuing forward to see if one, I could possibly be wrong, right? Or if I can have a different experience with the same stimulus later which his work does for me. I still can't say that I like it, um, but it does something. It lights, my, it lights my brain up. I'm not willing to quickly dismiss this because I find something about it offensive, which part of me does, by the way, right? Yeah. I'm like, what is with these lips and all this stuff going on? Yeah. But I know that there's something here. So I, I want to... I have to move forward because I want to find out more. And so I'm going to listen to what other people are experiencing in his works. And then maybe that'll light something in me. And also I, who's to say that you have to like, I think that learning from it, there's some, it's, it's actually this history that we're meant to, maybe this isn't a painting you're going to hang up in your home if you had the option, yeah. but to be able to, for all of us to sit and have this conversation and learn something and think about it. And then there's still more to peel back. It's not necessarily about liking. There's not like a, a flippant aesthetic about this. There's something, mm -hmm. there's all of these layers we're talking about. So artwork isn't always something to like, but something to consider and understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess for me, I just look at this and it's just menstrual jumps out, but then so does joy and community and family right and almost reverence in a way and i'm still trying to figure out that white jesus in the back corner with hmm. those two people kneeling it's just his work his work messes with me they're just keeping that's it simple. So great though that's like yeah. the best thing is that it sparks something it sparks conversation like nishat said would you go see it or would you hang it in your house? Maybe not, but you would maybe, if you're an art lover, go see it. And I think that's what's even more interesting to me about Cole Scott's work is that he takes iconic pieces and turns them into this incredible piece that makes you not only have to respect him as an artist, but makes you think about things that are happening today. And he's not even with us anymore, which is just mind boggling. But the fact that he's taking these He's like, you know, I mean, for me in my life as a black woman, it's a lot of like, oh, art. You like going to art museums? It's bougie. That's not for you. <laughs> That's not a thing that you do. But like, there are black artists and there are reasons to go and be, have thought provoking moments like these. And so much uh, like black art history or for me, Indian art history or many other, many like black and brown cultures, art was relegated to our ancient ancestors who have been incredible and masters of their craft, but it sort of stopped at a certain point. And the celebration of, you know, black and brown intellect, creativity, all of that really got halted for quite some time. So the, I think that the gift of this work, again, is not just 
something that's pretty that you see and say, wow, this is like beautiful. And that because it is beautiful, therefore it is good. Because I think something that is thought provoking as we're talking about is such a gift to go so deep, even into these moments of discomfort because avoiding discomfort is what keeps us in sort of problematic situations in our own um, communities, families, lifestyles, all of that. The um, So kind of similar to Chris, like I, I, I honestly was just kind of waiting to hear what everyone said about this because I I really do not like this, <laughs> this, this piece in particular. It makes me very uncomfortable. And it's got me kind of thinking about how again, throughout history, presentation of Black people has often started from a very bad place and it's been used as a way to drag things forward. You think of something like, we were just talking about Mammies and you think of someone like Hattie McDaniel winning an Oscar playing a Mammy in a movie. Mm -hmm. uh, a movie I will never watch, uh, but she the things yeah, that she it. did i won't um, <laughs> um but the things that she did made things stronger and better for other people behind her even though she got heat from everyone yeah for doing that not just from white people who are like what's this woman doing what's this woman doing winning winning one of our awards in our medium but black people are also like you're selling out you know so and it's it's not it's not always simple and there's probably millions of examples of that cole and scott took heat from the black community oh for yeah. sure yeah and yeah. and and that's the sort of thing where i look at this and and i have a hard time seeing joy because the first thing that hits me is that minstrel mm -hmm. yeah. it, and taking a step back it's like okay yeah it is there a little bit it is the, and it's obviously being played up in a way because it's got the uh you know the tgif font as leon put it and so it's 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 trying to learn the way to to yeah just to to keep sitting in it you can't even say the title without feeling like you're for me I mm -hmm. can't even say the title without feeling like I'm doing something wrong. Yes. If I'm reading the title, it feels like, ooh, my grandma would slap me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? You might still. Eat them taters. It's uncomfortable. Wow. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. And that's the other part of that is if I think if you didn't know about um, Van Gogh's piece, it's harder to swallow this because you do see it as this sort of scene but if you really like take it to that pack and forth or the juxtapose the people the the white people in the peasant of van gogh's painting are sad about all they have is potatoes black people have been eating just one thing or two things forever they know how to make a meal out of mm -hmm. onion. from the root to the tota baby <laughs> and some fat, right? and so, like, we're, like, we're good right and that's like that's what i kind of see is that yep We'll make joy out of anything. Mm -hmm. mm, interesting. It almost yeah. makes it seem like they're laughing at the people in Van Gogh's painting. Kind of like you're complaining about this. In a way, it's if you if what, I also am familiar with Van Gogh's painting. So when you think when I think about the comparison of the two, it's like two different tables at a, the same diner, and <laughs> what are the experiences going on going on between them? Mm. With the same bit with the same food but different different outcome yeah well um this is Jalisa speaking and i'm just keeping that in the time um it's 7 37 i was thinking maybe we could um move on and maybe look at some more of the q a questions sure can we have another image up so that eric can not have to you know cleanse the <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, I can pull up your palate cleanser visual. I care about you, Eric. I care about you. I'm just trying to make sure. See you. Well, for Q&A, uh, actually, I think we could just do a, a, a talk about yourselves. 
ourselves. Okay. Are there questions? Yeah. Anything that's popping out on the Q and A? It's what's popping um, over here. Looking right now. <laughs> Q and A. I know this is uncomfortable for a lot of people. Q and A ended up functioning more as the chat than the. Q Something <laughs> popped on that said, "Could you explain?" It just popped on the screen. What a menstrual! They're not understanding what menstrual. I, I think they are because when they typed it, they typed it. Yeah. menstrual as in oh, like menstruation, menstruation instead okay. of minstrel as as like uh, minstrel shows might get like you crampy. They, what's that minstrel shows <laughs> might get you crampy i'm cranky <laughs> well there's, there's actually two questions um towards the end that are specifically about the last painting um, so one person was wondering if you have any like further thoughts on the, the religious picture on the left. Um, yeah, it like, oh, I was thinking about you know, growing up in a uh, faux Christian home, like my mom Jamaica. told me after I went to college that the only reason why we went to church was so I could go to a really good school. And so it was her way of ensuring my success. And then she never went to church after that. Um, but so many, so much of black culture, if you think, if you ask anybody like, what is black culture rooted in? We're going to say Christianity. And it's like, we, we are both oppressed by and worshiping this creation of whiteness, this all knowing, all white being that our entire lives are surrounded by all of our actions are to please that and that is very intentional like strip us away from our like roots strip us away from our ancient wisdom and give us this thing that in the book that you are giving us tells us that we are slaves and we are lesser than so that's why i think that that's there is definitely calling out the like Yo, in the midst of this uh, kind of homely lowness, the shining light and the like future of glory is in being happy in your poverty now so that you can go sit on the right hand of the white man. Mm. Yeah. They're Just still the below of that picture. Yeah. They're still below those kneeling white people. For me, mm -hmm. it's just the presence of colonization. Yeah. Mm. Like, hey, don't forget. Like, hey, don't forget don't forget right tuesdays on nbc don't have too much fun <laughs> there with your potatoes and somebody <laughs> had uh, another question also about the same painting um on the last painting the the convening what is the significance of the roof there seems to be two different dimensions suggested so i can pull that back up yeah can you pull that back up yeah i might need you I to help me out here in the shop neat. I thought the house looked really neat and like it was like a nice. Oh, I see. Like exposed rafters. Isn't it just like a Portland restaurant? <laughs> <laughs> well, Portland Port 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 is, is as a concept of good old days that is its own uh, sort of historic erasure. Uh, I mean, I, to me, I, I have to look at it again, uh, the Van Gogh. I feel like this looks like not, like this was like a nice home, like the beams are solid. Like it's a solid structure and there's a clock, which I think, you know, is like signifies a little bit of money. You got a little money, you got a clock on the wall or they just- You got somewhere to be if you got a clock. You got somewhere to be, you have somewhere yeah. to be, you have a clock and everybody gets a cup and I don't know, the roof, I'd be curious about the thought process of Van Gogh and then moving into here. Um, someone says in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, the both masters are also in the Van Gogh painting, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just, is that person that's the only person who's back to us, are they standing? I think it's a child. Yeah, it yeah. It's really I, normal for children to not have a chair in those uh, times because yeah. it's expensive. <laughs> you don't you get a grow chair until you can make it. <laughs> chair for a kid. It's like you like, would stand. They're at the table height. So but, it feels weird. 
weird history I know, okay? I, I don't know why, but for me, as much as I don't like this painting, just like Eric, but the, the joy seems to stop, I guess, with the child. She, there's a, you talk about the sadness in the other painting. There's nothing to me, and I know we only hmm. see the back, but there's nothing joyful about that. They almost look like they're in trouble standing in a corner, to me. Like but I love that she's going to get a cup. Upside down. Yeah. I love mm. that she's going to get a cup because the gentleman has a cup and then there's still four cups on the table. So she's going to still be a part of the food celebration. True. Mm. In Van Gogh's painting, now I'm wondering if the person with the back to us is a black person. <laughs> yeah, they are. They almost, I was going to say, they almost really? look black. I've got they it are, right? It is. Yeah. Oh, wow. I need to see that mm. picture again. Even the poor ad servant. Mm. Um, you know, Eddie Reed, spot on with the stylization of the forward figure. Like, the forward figure is the least caric. It's not a caricature. It's the most, uh, I don't know what the time period would be called, uh, but the most similar to... Uh, also in the Van Gogh piece, I kind of yeah. pulled back, quote unquote, neat hair and like the dress, like it all looks prim and proper. Um, but there's also a rift in the scene that surrounds uh, this character, separating her from the rest of the group. Um, mm. They're kind of inhaling the smoke. Like, it's like, it's like, it's almost like the poison of the imagery of these minstrels is hitting that person so much that they're losing themselves. They don't even have a self almost. Um, yeah. I guess one other thing that I'm going back to that white Jesus, which I always say <laughs> white Jesus because um, there's something interesting. That that well, yeah, but, that too, but yeah, how, it's a specific many, Jesus. Oh, black Jesus. Mm -hmm. I call him how, black Jesus. But there's so many, when I was growing up in the 80s, I went to so many black homes where there were white Jesuses in. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like so many homes uh, of my aunts and uncles in Detroit, just white Jesus on the painting. And then that stopped. That stopped about 10 years later. Then you, you stopped had, going to their houses? No, or? there started being black Jesus up. Okay. And I and I'm I'm curious what, what happened there. Because white Jesus, I think the presence of white Jesus in this room is definitely significant. And two white people praying to white Jesus in that painting on their knees. That maybe there wasn't a black Jesus available because it's the same thing with like black Barbie or black whatever or black brown Santa. Skin brown skin cabbage patch doll or whatever like these things don't exist so you what, what did you what could you do you wanted to have the presence of jesus in your home so i guess you just got the white jesus i have to say i've i i have seen black jesus paintings in philadelphian homes probably around the same era so i don't oh, know okay. if they, maybe they didn't make it to, 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 to detroit yet <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe <laughs> All right. <laughs> the lagging religious art scene of Detroit. Just Philly was gobbling it up. I don't know. I'm going to pull this one down real quick um, because we're starting to near the end of the program. And there was one question that I saw that I wanted to return to, and it was asked early on. Um, so like throughout this conversation, like we've talked about the layers in, in Cole Scott's work. We've talked about like you, several people have mentioned that like, moment where you see something and you laugh, but then the more you chew on it and the more you think about it, the more it takes you to a different place. Um, and someone earlier had asked, what definition of satire are you using, are you using in the discussion? And I think that would, is a really interesting question just towards Broke Gravy in general as someone who does a lot of, as a group who does a lot of improv um, and then also interweaves a lot of comedy. You know, I'm just curious about what satire is for you and how it functions for you uh, just within your own work and then how it's functioning in Cole Scott's work or how you see it functioning. And I also just want to open that up and extend it to Siobhan and Nishat because I think those um, layers of like laughter and comedy have um, 
helped unearth some like really deep or really challenging things in this work. Mm -hmm. um, for, for me, like my definition of satire is kind of that um, you take something that you know is a truth, potentially an uncomfortable truth, and then you yes and it, yes and it, yes and it, and you magnify it to uh, comedic proportions in order to be able to have the conversation. Um, I, I think that laughter and humor is a great tool for disarming and for getting people to think about and talk about things that they never would uh, otherwise. And so that's the, like I always say like, you know, there's plenty of people who can write brilliant brand new material. Um, but what I like to deliver is truth. Like if we start a show just speaking from our own day-to-day -day truths, and then we begin to like dig into it, build it, build it, build it. All of a sudden you get that like that front of the seat enjoyment from the audience where they're engaged and they can see the story because they know the story, whether it's their own story or it's something that they've witnessed and they haven't want to engage with. And so that's where I see satire uh, coming in, in Broke Gravy's work. And I also see the same thing in a lot of uh, the Cole Scott work that we're looking at. Yeah, I, for me, satire has always been a rooted in truth with a slight exaggeration. Um, I guess you could kind of debate where satire turns into farce. Um, farce usually being over the top, which some of the stuff maybe even dips into a little bit, but um, generally there's just something slightly off about it, even if it's an overemphasis of something that can kind of point out the absurdity surrounding it. And as you've seen just from us chatting about it tonight or from the video that uh, me, Leon and Chris made earlier examining his work, it's as simple as just starting with one thing that one of us notices mm -hmm. and it just spirals. It's that yes and that Leon was talking about where you're just like, oh, well, if that's true, what else is true in this picture? What else is true in the world that this picture is being birthed from? And uh, even stuff uh, with that, it's, it's not just the things that are in the painting. And there is so much in some of his paintings that you could literally spend hours on one at a time, come back a week later and spend another couple hours on it. Um, but it, it sparks memories, it sparks feelings, emotions that you can't help but kind of take the minute in the picture and extrapolate outward and back again, just looking at, at everything that's going on in the picture, how it affects you. I mean, case in point, Chris and I both talked about how much we despised Ethan Taters. And we still got a lot out of it. And in the last like five minutes, we found something new and we could have kept talking about it even longer just with the realization that that person when comparing it to the Van Gogh was probably black. And that brings up all kinds of thorny stuff about just black community relations, which, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation uh, that, you know, we don't have, we have eight minutes or so to get into what, to whatever to talk about. So, you know, the, that's, for me, that's what satire is. And that's in our work, we, yeah, we, we love to start our shows with conversations because whether it's us or people in our audience, uh, that truth is where you're going to find the, the, the funniest or most sobering nuggets or sometimes both at the same time. Yeah, I don't need to add to that. They <laughs> they said a lot there. That was good. But I will say that I use satire to expose hypocrisy and hypocrisy in myself, mm -hmm. hypocrisy in the world. That's the joy that I get out of it. And I wonder for Cole Scott, I mean, we definitely don't have time to get into this, but I've noticed uh, 
he seems to be commenting on the standard of beauty of women a lot in his works to me. And yet I also feel like he's objectifying them at the same time. And there's a, I don't know if you want to call that hypocrisy, but there's something in that that makes me, I'm interested, but I'm also very uneasy with it. Um, yeah, yeah. So hypocrisy really shows up a lot. Like that human contradiction that, mm -hmm. you know, we say one thing and then also kind of do some things that are yes. against that because yeah. shit's way too complicated. Like it's, it's not that simple. Nothing's black and white. Yeah. Yeah. And none of his work is either. Mm -hmm. Interested to hear from Siobhan and the shot just in your lives and, you know, seeing that a lot of the issues in this work are echoing now and very loudly um, in very big ways. I mean, how does like satire, laughter, comedy, like play into not just the work, but I mean, understanding where we're at right now? I think that uh, if we cannot laugh, if we can't find laughter in our experience in life, in some of the, so many of the challenging times that we have, will only be so sad. And I think that where there is, for me, I am an illustrator and I do a lot of illustration about my own depression, but I don't sort of put that first. It's, it's similar in the way it's very like simple semi-surrealist comics. It's really simple stuff, but I think the making fun of it a little bit is an invitation to be like, oh no, no, no. it's like, it's not scary. And I'm not like, I, I'm not gonna like bog you down with my, my feelings, which of course, people should feel open to talk about their feelings to their friends, but it's instead, if there's like a little bit of a joke or a little bit of levity, perhaps people can, will be, feel more comfortable to come look into the reality. Um, when we were talking about satire, I mean, satire is using humor to invite people in to understand the critique or to ex understand something that maybe they wouldn't want to peel, peel back even, even more. And I think that that's, um, certainly just a way I go about life so often because there's so many hard things being a woman of color leader in my organization that I work in being um, a woman of color just in life I think there, there's so there's so many different um, ways that you ha have to or don't have to but can disarm yourself or rearm yourself to then invite people in to get them later um with the work of Colescott and the satire conversation, for me, it's, it starts to make me think about the um, the line between laughing with and being laughed at. And that's really blurry um, because growing up in a predominantly white uh, place, you, you, you wanna make the joke first, mm -hmm. right? And you wanna get ahead of it. And so I'm used to doing that as a survival tactic. And so to see the art in this way, and I think that's for me, like why the pieces that are um, uh, taken from iconic pieces and added with these things really spark something for me because I, it makes people who know the work think about it. But I still have a hard time with that line when it comes to the sort of conversation, especially about the mammies or um, this, the big lips and the over-exaggerated darkness and faces and all these sort of things. And so it's just a really blurry place to be in, but I love that it makes people stop and get uncomfortable and think because that's what has to happen because they're not seeing um, life from other people's perspectives otherwise in some ways. Mm -hmm. So this is a great way to just sort of put it out there and for people to see it and now have to have to chew it. <laughs> you know, there's um, there's a very specific moment that uh, this brings up within me. And it's like, after uh, George Floyd's murder, there was about a week and a half or two weeks where uh, the company that I worked at didn't really like acknowledge it in any way and while I was frustrated with it I was also I felt a 
okay because the people who I was talking to about my feelings, I knew that they were truly feeling the same thing. And there was a community within the void. But then as soon as it became a, a thing, now it became a, hey, now everybody at the company is talking about it. They all wanted to talk to me about it before talking to each other about it. And so now I have this burden. And it's the same feeling that I experienced between going into this packed viewing of the preview of Cole Scott and being, I think there was me, Chris, Eric, and another black man who I saw in there amongst a sea of whiteness. And there is that feeling of, oh shit, even if they weren't, I have the feeling that they're looking to me to validate their understanding of the paintings versus when we got to go to the special viewing and just be there as the three of us. It was like, yo, oh, I can have a conversation about this stuff. And I, and that's, you can see it. You can, you can see, see it. it. I'm not looking at you looking at me. I'm, I'm being selfish right now mm-hmm. and taking care of myself. Well, and with that, I think that's a, a nice place to close. Um, I really appreciate everybody being here and a part of this conversation and getting through moments and, you know, sifting through really heavy and complex, um, just like areas of, of, you know, I don't know, just complexity in general, <laughs> and the way it's showing up in the work and then reflected back in our life. And, you know, one of the things that I was starting to think about is you all were talking about like satire and um, comedy. I started thinking about like, whoa, laughter and what you're laughing at is really a mirror. It just, it, it, the question sort of ricochets back, why are you laughing? And then you have to like sit with a part of yourself. And I feel like that's a, also built into the work, you know, Cole Scott's work is it, it bounces right back and we're asked to sit with a part of ourselves um, that's reflected. And so with that, I hope that um, I wanna thank all of the folks, a part of this round table discussion. Thank you, Leon, Chris, Eric, Siobhan, Nishat. Thank you so, so, so much for your time and your words. Um, And I wanna thank also the audience for being here, for willing to sit and engage and get through some tough questions and to pose tough questions. And I just hope that this, um, one of the things I'm hoping this closing program does is that it's really more of an opening because the Cole Scott show is leaving the Portland Art Museum. But even though the work's leaving, these conversations don't have to end. This is a jumping off point, a point of departure where I encourage everyone to have these conversations regularly with your friends, with your loved ones, like keep these questions going, um, no matter how uncomfortable they are, because I think that's really where the potential is for learning and growth. So thank you everybody for coming. And I hope you have a lovely Thursday night. Thank Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. you. Subscribe. Subscribe now. (laughs) (laughs) Check out this button for more content. (laughs) That's the link.